Good morning, everyone. It is great to see you, great to worship with you today. And good morning and hello to everybody with us worshiping from many different locations online this morning. Um, hey, thank you for praying for us, if you remembered to. Um, we went to our midwinter conference in Chicago this week, our first denominational event in over two years. And I gotta tell you, these are people, friends in ministry that I normally get to see every couple of months and I haven't seen them in over two years, so my heart is so full. Uh, Leanne and Dave and I enjoyed time away and got to learn a lot and grow a lot together. Um, also, you know, we did ask for your prayer, but some of you didn't pray because it was, uh, the wind chill was negative nine. So if next time you could pray, that'd be great. Uh, we are in a series called Pursuit, and we've started this year talking about some of the reasons for which Christ pursues us, humanity. And we started by looking at scripture and how God pursues us because he loves us. God is love. He wants relationship with us. Uh, then we looked at God's pursuit of us through creation and through our salvation. This is all his pursuit of us for his glory. And then last week, I preached on God pursues us so that we can do good works, as it reads in Ephesians 2, but we took the pressure off of our shoulders and remembered that it's actually not us doing good for God, it's God accomplishing good through us, that we're just the conduit, that he's the source of all good things. And, and today, uh, we have a treat for you because I have some friends that are going to join me up here in a moment as we talk about God pursuing us so that we can live missionally, like live with this deep purpose in our hearts to see others come to know the life-changing, soul-redeeming grace and love that we know exists in God alone. So we'll listen to stories and testimonies today and be encouraged in our own lives, but first... God's Word. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20, perhaps a passage that you are familiar with. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. As though God was making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. If you are a professing Christian today, you are living on assignment. You have an assignment on your life this very moment. You have this ministry and this message of reconciliation, of redemption. And you might be thinking, a definition would be nice, for ministry of reconciliation. Here's just one that we could work with. A Christian's spirit-empowered service, not personal power, not personal strength, not personal creativity, not personal gifts and skills, not personal personality trait, all these things, right? Spirit-empowered service that introduces others to God's love. I want you to think for a moment about love relationships in middle school. For some of you, it's been a while. But for some of you, it's fresh, right? Love relationships in middle school. Rarely do you hear about a young middle school couple meeting and falling in love and planning their wedding without the assistance of a what? A friend. So, when you like someone in middle school, you recruit a very important person called your ambassador. And this person has the task of making an appeal on your behalf to the person that you like. And you better find a good ambassador because a lot hangs in the balance here. This is potential marriage we're talking about. So this person gets on the phone, they call so-and-so, and they say, hey, so-and-so has a crush on you. That's what the ambassador does. And then life got more interesting when they invented this thing called a three-way call. 
because you could call as an ambassador, but the person who has the crush could be on the line and could listen and, and see how good this was going. So this is how middle school romance is created. I've been on these calls. I was the guy with the crush on girls. I also served as an ambassador. Funny, this week I realized I didn't get a lot of calls from girls telling me that their friend liked me, but whatever. <laughs> this is middle school romance. The ambassador plays a pivotal role on a much grander scale. We have a role to play on behalf of God. As it says that he wants to make his appeal to the world through you. There are a lot of people right outside the doors of this church that God loves very much and they don't even know it. Let that sink in for a second. You are surrounded by people every day, really, who God loves as much as he, get this, loves you. And the sacrifice that he made of Christ for you is the same sacrifice that he made for your neighbor or your friend or your coworker or your teammate or your classmate. A lot of people out there that God loves deeply and they don't even know it. So he chooses you as his ambassador. A chosen ambassador is a trusted diplomat authorized to speak on behalf of God's kingdom. What greater role and responsibility could we live with each and every day than to be entrusted with this message? Author Leslie Newbigin writes, and I love his book, uh, Gospel in a Pluralist Society. I love this author because he challenges me so much in my thinking. He says, if the gospel is the story of the astonishing act of God himself coming down to be a part of our alienated world, to endure the full horror of our rebellion against love, to take the whole burden of our guilt and our shame, and to lift us up into communion and fellowship with himself, breaking into our self-centered search for our own happiness, shifting the center from the self and its desire onto God and his glory. He says, if that is the gospel, then listen how he describes the perversion of the gospel. The perversion of the gospel is when Christians turn the good news into something that they could possess for themselves, privatizing this mighty work of grace and talking as if the whole cosmic drama of salvation culminated in this question, how can only I be saved? Instead of thinking about the salvation of others. An ambassador of Christ lives with an unquenchable desire to see others come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Not just about me, but others. So speaking of others, now's the good part of the sermon. Um, I've invited three friends who you can join me now up here who are not strangers to Redeemer Church, but three people who I love dearly, respect greatly, and who have shared their stories and their lives with me. Um, and people who I believe do embrace this missional lifestyle to live every day with this awareness, this intentionality of what it looks like to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ. So let me introduce to you, if you haven't met them already, the Director of Church Development at Mission of Hope in Haiti in the Dominican Republic, Ruben Senea, Academic Coach at Crossover Prep Academy, Mark Cruz, and Director of Community and Partner Relations at The Common Good, Gretchen Gillett. Would you put your hands together and welcome these three wonderful people. So one of the things I'm really excited about these three sharing today is that sometimes we can be guilty of thinking that living missionally is something that ministers do, right? We'll leave that up to the local church pastors. Uh, but one thing I love about Mark and Gretchen is they have both previously been on staff at Redeemer. You are not a quitter. <laughs> They've recently or previously been on staff here 
uh, but have stepped away in order to faithfully step into what God has called them to do. Uh, so it kind of, you know, blows up the idea that to be missional, you got to work at a church. So thank you for that. Um, I love you three so much and think the world of you. Thank you for coming and sharing today. Let's just start by you introducing yourself and sharing just a minute about your context and your ministry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I work in Haiti. Uh, you know, for a lot of us think, man, that's a difficult place. It is a difficult place to work. But uh, my job has to do with community development, meaning we help people get into homes. Uh, we help uh, make sure people hear and see the gospel of Jesus Christ. We help people with health care. But everything we do, we try to do them uh, through the, the local church. So I get to work with a group of 20 to 25 young men and women. Uh, they, they spread around the island, and the job is to make sure we equip the pastors, uh, giving them what they need so they can uh, reach those that are lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the Common Good operates a community center called The Hub, which is in a former grocery store just west of downtown Tulsa. And The Hub is birthed from this amazing church. After a decade of your huge investment and engagement in the school, Mark Twain Elementary, and the community. So we've been open about two and a half years, and from the beginning, The Common Good has been about helping hurting people, so love mercy, in addressing the cause of the hurt do justice. So we work with children and families to equip, empower, and um, equip, empower, and address critical needs. Um, so we do that. We do that through sports and education and counseling and mentoring-based programs to actively combat the devastating challenges of poverty. And we also, to do that, we partner with churches and organizations and others with a shared vision to love, serve, and work together for individual and um, community transformation. Beautiful. I get the, the chance um, to serve at an organization called Crossover in the heart of North Tulsa. And one of our biggest driver as an organization is that, yes, Spiritual needs is absolutely important, but we care about the whole person. We care about the whole heart. And we have different entities in crossover, such as Crossover Bible Church, uh, Crossover Health Clinic. We have an all-boys school that I get the chance to serve at. We have an all-girls school that just launched uh, this year, starting with sixth grade. Uh, we have housing economic development. And uh, this year, we have the awesome opportunity to, uh, we have a community center that's going to be built uh, this, later on this year. But I get the, the awesome honor to serve uh, in the all-boys school, like I said, uh, working alongside with high school students to do life with them. And so, that's what I get to do. That's great. Um, I know all three of you very, very closely, and I know there are many peaks that you experience in ministry, but also a lot of valleys uh, and days that you, you may want to throw in the towel. It's, it's, it's hard to keep putting one foot in front of the other. So at the end of the day, what motivates you to stay committed? Yeah, I mean, I, I can talk about you know, things that discourage me a lot. I, my wife would tell you, Pretty much every other week, I, I'm, I want to resign. I want to quit. Because I'm like, this business is hard business. Trying to change people when you walk in a country. Political issues, insecurities, all those things together affecting our ministry. Uh, it gets frustrating. But somehow, God always have a way to remind me personally of the call upon my life to sonship with him. And the second is uh, remind me of grace and why we do what we and, and I always joke saying this in my household, if, 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 if the people, life transformation, if it was an easy business, Jesus would not die for it. Mm. He gave his life for it. So those things we might, and also in Haiti, the highs can be super high. The lows can be low. So all those things together, but God remind me of the miracles and things he done and the promises of tomorrow. If he did it before, he can do it again. Good. Yeah. Amen to that. Uh, I actually brought some props along to help me answer this question. And I, oh, upside down, yeah. 
I have uh, my two assistants here helping me, but uh, the first is a picture that hangs on the wall in my office, and it's of um, scripture that actually is graffitied on the wall inside the hub before it was actually remodeled. And Tammy Roach and Sherry Yeager were the ones that tatted this for us. But it reads, it's the message version of John 1.14, and it says, The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. And this has been an anchor verse for me for years before we even got to the finish the building, but it is to what is to become of the hub. Um, and the second is th this plaque that is actually, it says 74127, the chosen zip code. And this was coined from Amy Wopsall. Um, and it's significant because the community viewed themselves as the forgotten zip code, and we wanted to change that. So um, in answering um, Adam's question, what motivates me or lights me up or almost really keeps me awake at night is this unbelievable privilege and blessing that God says you, well, actually, we have the opportunity to change the narrative of a community. Mm -hmm. And that I get to be proximate every day with children, with youth, with families, um, building relationships and partnerships that actually can provide real hope and help. And I get to work closely with the churches, the local churches in the community, to see the hope of the gospel lived out to the glory of God. Amen to that. Um, Adam, I think of two things as far as motivation. I, I think of two things. The, the first one is this, and it's found in Judges 2, verse 10. And it talks about a generation, a generation that does not know the Lord or the works of the Lord. And so as I think about that verse, there is a generation right now that does not know the Lord or the works of the Lord. And I get to play a part, a small part, mm. in seeing God do some incredible things. Uh, the second one is this. As I scan around the scripture, the Bible says, love your neighbors, right? And um, we are currently in the process of moving more north to be in proximity to the people that we get the chance to serve. I think it is so important to be in proximity to the people that we get the chance to serve. We're not some outsiders 30 to 45 minutes away, but we want to be the people who are in proximity with people to serve. And so I, I think of those two things, Adam. Yeah, it's right there on your illustration. You know, Christ moves into the neighborhood. Um, your stories and your testimonies inspire me so much. Would you share a way uh, in which you've seen God move recently? Yeah. Uh, uh, last year, there, there was an earthquake in Haiti, and, and I got to be, a, be there, serve those uh, in need. And then I remember that morning, we wake up early, 4 a.m., and decided we got to hike that mountain to see what's going on, how we can serve people, check things out. And we decided to grab a cell phone and head up there. And by the time we get there by noon or 1 p.m., and what we saw was breathtaking. People in situation were the closer to death versus life. And, and with that, we were able to help him and, and call the U.S. military, came out and rescue him and take him to hospital and, and, then, and then save their lives. And today I get to see, see them. I call them once in a while, see how they're doing, on fire for Jesus, and I always say, God, save me. And miracles like that, like I said previously, those are the things that keep us going and, and encourage us because God is moving even if we don't see it or mm -hmm. we're not feeling it. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, that's good. And I would say God is on the move in big and tangible ways every day at the hub. And the story that I'm sharing, I call it like a God wink. It's about the land that the hub sits on. And I learned the story not too long ago, the longer version of it, and that actually the hub sits on land that was once owned by Verndale Church of God of Prophecy. And it was their hope and their vision for the future to build that church that it would be a beacon of light and hope for the community. And, un and I heard that there were many bake sales to make this happen, but they ended up selling 
the land to the warehouse market, and so that was that story. And unbeknownst to me, the girl that leads our women's Bible study at the Hub, her name is Denise, was a member as a young child of the Verndale Church of God of Prophecy. And she remembers baking pies with her grandmother um, to raise money and feels like such a full circle to be serving back to be a beacon of hope and light to the community. And one of our ladies that attends the Bible study has come to meet Jesus. And um, she is my sister for sure because she is loud and passionate and a bit crazy. Um, But she is three months um, drug free. Praise and God. she, yeah, praise God. And she is learning to navigate this new walk and getting plugged into one of the local churches and even serving on their, um, what do they call it? Their, their homeless outreach. So I just think that's just a sweet story of the land that our building sits on. Wow. Amen to both of y'all uh, stories. As I think about that question, um, again, I get the chance to serve at the all boys school and our passion. I can say this because I get to work alongside the teachers. We really, really, really want to see students to come to know the Lord. And that's the story. Like we have a group of people. Yes, academics is great. That's awesome. But we're all there because we want to see these students to come to know Jesus Christ because we know at the end of the day that they will be the agents, the ambassadors that you just use, Adam in their community. And that's why I get to do what I get to do. That's wonderful. Um, So here you are with the congregation at Redeemer who scatter everywhere each and every day. We gather together for worship, but then we part ways and go our different directions. Um, What encouragement do you have for the church today of, of living missionally, taking this call in scripture to be an ambassador, a carrier of that message and that ministry of reconciliation in a fractured world, how would you encourage the church today? Uh, You know, a lot of time when people hear the word mission, and it can be scary sometimes because we think, I got to travel, I got to raise money, I got to do all these things. But at the end of the day, it's not, it's bigger than that. It's about intentionally building relationship with people next door, the neighbor. Uh, when you go to the park, the soccer games, and all those things, relationship counts so much. And, and these days I start realizing people are watching us. And when, once they see something different about us, that will attract them whether to ask questions, what is it about you guys, what my wife and I would go to the park with our kids and a lot of time we get people coming up and say, hey, what exactly, what's your story? And that opened doors to, to tell them what we do and who we are. And the call is not, a lot of us don't really know how to share the gospel really well. That's okay. But we can live in a way in our neighborhood where people can see and feel the gospel of Jesus Christ through what we do and how we, our lifestyle in general. Wow, that was really good. (laughs) Um, I am going to keep it very simple and say to watch and see where God is working and join him. And I actually borrowed that from a Bible study this church did many, multiple decades ago called Experiencing God. And Henry Brackaby was the one that said, watch and see where God is working and join him. And he bases it off of John 5, 17, where it said, God is always at work, and Jesus only sees what he, his father is doing. So watch and see where God is at work and join him. Yeah. Can I just say this? There is absolutely nothing special with the three of us. Zero. Zero. I think th- the difference is, is that we answered the call, the yes on our table. I think the big takeaway here is that as I scan around scripture, I don't see the pursuit of chasing being comfortable anywhere. I don't. If you can find it, please talk to me after the service. I don't see it anywhere. I also don't see anywhere in Scripture to sit idly sitting by. 
I, I, I don't. And so the question, the takeaway for us this morning, for me, is that what is your part? What is your role? You are in a job for a reason. You are in a school for a reason. You are in that fourth hour class for a reason. You're not called to sit idly chilling by. You are called to make noise for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This is the call. Will you put your yes on the table? That's good. Thank you, three. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, an honor to learn from you and to hear your stories, to be inspired by how I see you live. And, and here's the other thing. I think because this is your full-time call, right? It's your vocation. It's what you do during the day. I, I just honor, this is who you are. Uh, when you leave too. This is who you are all the time. Um, so thank you. you, you inspire me and I love each of you and I'm grateful for your stories. Can we thank them today and honor what God has done? Uh, you can do better than that. Thank you. Thank you. Will you pray with me today? God, thank you for Reuben. Thank you for Gretchen. Thank you for Mark. For their stories, for their testimonies, for their ministries, for their hearts that are so intentional to carry out that awesome privilege of being ambassadors, messengers of hope and reconciliation and your love. God, will you help all of us to have eyes to see and ears to hear where you are already moving and then to have the courage to step in, to participate in your ministry to our neighbors, to our coworkers, to our friends, to strangers. You're always moving. We want to play a part. We want to be a part. We want you to use us as you see fit for your kingdom, for your glory. Through Christ, we pray. Amen.